because I get to see your faces during the presentation like I would if I was doing a live presentation. So uh, feel free to ask questions along the way or at the end, um, I'm up for whatever. And I'll go ahead and share my screen and we'll go ahead and get started. All right, so today we're gonna to be talking about mix and match meal prep. So we're gonna go over how to make some tasty but healthy meals and modify your favorite meals with a healthy twist. So we're gonna go over the basics and we're gonna cover some healthy swaps then we'll get into the mixing and matching. So with this, I really want you to recall the basics. Again, I'm, I'm very practical as a dietitian and I like to remind people that they are the experts of their own lives. They know best what works for them and I don't usually impart much new information. I just kind of present it in a different way. So think about the basics, what you know is healthy food, what you know is less healthy food or less optimal, I like to say, um, and really look and see, is your overall diet balanced? Do you eat a variety of foods, you know, vegetables, fruits, whole grains, some low fat dairy, some lean protein, and really trying to get, you know, the, the my plate image that's there on the slide, trying to get that content in your diet. Uh, limiting your saturated fat and cholesterol intake, reducing your refined sugar intake, cutting back on salt and high sodium foods. Again, none of that is really new surprising information. Um, and just remembering that a healthy diet is not a rigid prescription, but it's a healthy frame that you can use to build your life on that healthy diet. So again, maximizing our lean protein sources, skinless chicken breast, some eggs, maybe some salmon, get those nice healthy fats, again, low fat dairy, all the fruits and vegetables, if you name a fruit or vegetable and you like it, go ahead and grab it and eat it. Getting moderate amounts of our mono and polyunsaturated fats, so avocado, olive oil, some legumes, then some complex carbohydrates that are whole grains, uh, popcorn, but again, as we discussed last time, it's being mindful of what you put on the popcorn that uh, can make it less optimal. Um, you know, even corn that can get a bad rap sometimes is a whole grain. Again, being mindful of what you, you put on the, the corn kernels. So, um, you know, focusing on getting in those complex carbohydrates and then minimizing the simple carbs. So the cakes, the sugars, the candies, the white breads, even the dried fruit is often sweetened and we don't realize it, that it's more calories than, than eating the, the whole fruit itself. Um, and then our saturated fat, hot dogs, bacon, fried foods, things like that. All right, so diving into then some healthy swaps. So how do we go and shift from those higher calorie snacks to those more nutrient dense snacks? So it could be taking something like tortilla chips where usually we're after that crunch and we typically are dipping the tortilla chips in something. Well, can you take that same food item and instead take carrots and dip carrots into that, whether it's hummus, guacamole, you know, carrots are a very versatile thing that you can substitute for chips and still get to that nice crunch. Um, they do even make um, little shaved carrot chips that you can, um, you know, grab and that way you're more likely, you know, you can scoop with like an actual like flat ship, uh, chip shaped item if that's something that you're looking for. Uh, if you don't like carrots, what else can you do? Maybe some cucumber slices, you know, looking and seeing if we take the tortilla chips, what might be a healthier snack that we can swap out. Um, fruit products with added sugars, again, going for the whole fruit itself, refined, gra refined grains to whole grains, snacks with added salt or sugars, moving towards snacks without those added salt or sugars. I like to make my own trail mix and I typically will buy three or four bags of nuts and seeds and all of them will be unsalted except for one of those bags. So that one bag of salted goes in with the other three bags of unsalted and then combined it makes a nice snack that has a little bit of salt but a lot less than if I had bought four bags of salted nuts and seeds. And again, getting away from those solid fats and moving towards those healthy oils. And being mindful of our beverages as well. Oftentimes we don't think about the calories that we're drinking um, in our liquids. So, you know, can you maybe change the size of your coffee, move to a small or go from whole milk to fat-free milk, um, you know, switch to a splash of heavy cream instead of, a, you know, a whole bunch of whole milk. Little things like that can still give you the mouthfeel that we're after when we drink our, our creamy coffees, but it can really help save on calories. And again, going from regular cola to water, I know that my favorite thing right now is my Hint water. I don't go anywhere without it. This is their strawberry kiwi flavor. And they do also have sparkling flavors, but I like the still water. And this is my, my new favorite thing. And 
Um, so I've had a couple of cases shipped to my house from their website, and that's helping me stay hydrated as our weather keeps getting a little bit warmer, although we've had a, a brief break from the hot, uh, hot weather this week, it seems. So, and then being mindful also of other things that can be sweetened and finding ways to enjoy them with less sugar. So for our proteins then, instead of a fatty steak, maybe switching to salmon. It's not going to be that same red meat taste, but it does give you those nice healthy fats and still gives you that protein. Instead of whole eggs, maybe grabbing egg whites or egg substitute, um, or even reducing if you want to go, instead of doing three whole eggs, do two egg whites and one whole egg, and that way it's one yolk shared among those three eggs. Uh, going instead of a fried chicken thigh with the skin, going for maybe an air fried skinless chicken breast. The air fryers use a fraction of the oil that you would use in the normal frying process, and it really is um, a great way to get a similar taste. Nothing is ever going to replace that nice crunchy skin on a fried chicken, but it does get you really close and can help keep you satisfied even while making that healthier swap. And then our fats, what could we do to make our fats healthier in our diet? So instead of going for a white sauce, maybe move to a red sauce go from cream-based cream to broth-based, from creamy dressing to olive oil and vinegar. And this doesn't mean that you have to make these swaps at every single meal so that you're never having the foods that you enjoy. I know that I love it when we have pasta day here at Eisenhower in the cafeteria, and I will typically have them mix the white sauce and the red sauce because while I would love to have a whole bowl with the white sauce on it, I know that the red sauce is gonna be better. So I have them mix it half and half, and I really enjoy that. And that way I still am enjoying my pasta, we don't have it here all the time, so when I, we do have pasta day, I enjoy it. And I have that with some chicken and some veggies. And it makes it really enjoyable for me, but I know I am making a slightly smarter choice than if I had just gone for the full cream sauce. And carbs and starches, I feel like this is where a lot of people struggle with making healthy swaps. Um, but it can be something simple like finding, instead of a plain pasta, finding a lentil or protein pasta. Um, I know that I found a brand of veggie rice that rather than being like broccoli rice or cauliflower rice where it's, the vegetable is shaped into pieces of rice, this is instead lentil uh, flour, excuse me, and chickpea flour that that is formed into then rice grains. And it, so it tastes and has a texture of real rice, but it's made out of vegetable flour. And I've fallen in love with that, um, that veggie rice and that's pretty much what I use for my rice now because I'm getting a serving of, of veggies and yes, there is still carbohydrates in it, but it's a smarter choice than if I were to grab a bowl of white rice. Again, you know, instead of going for a pancake with regular syrup, grabbing a whole grain waffle with light syrup, you know, very simple swap there that you can still enjoy that breakfast food, but you're making a smarter choice and reducing your sugar and refined, refined sugar intake, excuse me. And again, whole grain bread, I love the bread with the nuts and the seeds and all those nice little things on it. Now, not everyone tolerates that, but if you can tolerate it, moving towards that higher fiber diet with things like whole grains is a really great idea. And I know cheesecake with sweet and drizzle, oh my gosh, it can be really good, especially after a nice yummy meal, but maybe trying some shortcake with fresh strawberries instead. You can still get that flavor that you're looking for and enjoy your dessert, but you know, having it as a smarter choice. And then oftentimes in a, on the American diet, we treat our carbs like the entree. So we'll have a big old plate of pasta with then, you know, a little bit of protein on it and then maybe some veggies sprinkled in instead of having a plate of veggies with some protein and then the pasta as a side. Um, so really thinking of how can we make the, the carb or the starchy, starchy foods more of a, as a side rather than an entree in our plate. All right, so diving into mix and match. So this is a really great resource that I got. Um, at the end, I do have a link for it. So if you're interested in going to the actual website, um, I did get their permission to share it, but Precision Nutrition is a really great website that has a lot of good content and is one of the more reputable websites for nutrition information. So there's a few that I would tell you not to look at, but I actually like what Precision, Precision Nutrition has to say. So if you ever have any um, curiosity and you wanna do a Google search, Rather than just going to the top link, you know, really look and see if there's a good source and Precision Nutrition is one of them. So how do we create the perfect meal? So these next few slides that I'll be going over are kind of some ideas of where we can mix and match. So looking and seeing where is the optimal flavor, the maximum flavor and minimal work. And also what are your own personal preferences? If you don't like a spice or something like that, don't use it. Um, I know that I don't like onions. And I'm not going to be putting onions in anything. So, and then here with this um, this upcoming um, slide, we'll have hundreds 
of per perfectly portioned meals that taste great and support your health goals. So again, a lot of, lot of great variety here. And um, it's just a really awesome infographic that they created and I'm very glad that they allowed me to share it. All right, so it was a very long graphic, so I did divide it into individual slides. But basically for this first part, we're looking at the four columns. So choosing one ingredient from each of the four columns below. And then make your selection based off what you're in the mood for and what's available or both. I know that certain grocery stores are having difficulty with some items. Other stores are getting those items in. So it might be, you know, choosing if you're trying to stay safe and only go to one grocery store, you may not get your top choice of one column. But um, if you're willing to go look for it at another grocery store or ask a friend who's going to that grocery store to pick it up for you, those are some, some options. But in our protein column, we can see the beans and eggs. And um, those are just some options there. Again, it was hard to get it all on one slide. So we're going to kind of go through it and then we'll go back in and do the mixing and matching. Um, but some great vegetable choices, broccoli and red cabbage for our smart carbs, doing some spaghetti squash or some red potatoes, and then maybe some olive oil and walnut oil are healthy fat options here. Versus now, so again, it's the protein column on the left, so chicken or steak, going with a lean steak and chicken breast, skinless if possible. And then our veggie choices, we have green beans or bok choy. Bok choy can be a little intimidating at first, but I found that it really is super simple to prepare. Um, and it's, to me, very similar to like wilting spinach. Um, sweet potatoes, brown rice for our smart carb options, and then maybe some sesame oil or avocado oil. Now, I like to use the toasted sesame oil. It gives a little bit more of a, of a nuttier taste than just the plain sesame oil because the sesame seeds themselves have been toasted prior to be making the oil. Um, so I prefer that, that toasted sesame oil taste. And then for our protein options, we have shrimp or red lentils. I recently found a brand of pasta that is uh, red lentil based, uh, fusilli, I believe I'm saying that correctly. And it's a really great pasta that um, when I cook it, it does lose some of the red flavor initially, but it has really great um, fiber content. It has some protein from the red lentils and it's still a pasta, which I think you could probably tell that that's one of my favorite foods since it's kind of my go-to example that I like to give. For our veggie choices, we have spinach or kale. I am not a fan of kale and I will readily admit to that. So I would definitely default to choosing spinach over kale. Quinoa, which is something that again, can be a little intimidating at first, but it's super easy to prep and I love it. It goes great in everything. Even just sprinkling it on top of your salad or things like that, it can just give a nice little flavor. Um, sometimes a little bit, not a crunch per se, but just some good texture to it. Um, and then chickpeas, which I also love, are a great smart carb choice. And then we have for different fats, some canola oil or maybe some extra virgin olive oil. For me, I'm not a huge fan of the extra virgin, um, excuse me, coconut oil, just because I don't like the flavor of coconut as much and it does leave a little bit of a lingering flavor. So just be mindful if you're not a fan of coconut flavor, maybe don't use the coconut oil. All right, so for our other protein options here, we have uh, pressed yogurt or scallops. For our veggie options, we have eggplant or carrot. Uh, for eggplant, I really like, um, a really simple thing that I like to do is to use eggplant kind of as like the, the bun of a sandwich and put what I would normally put between a sandwich in between two slices of eggplant and, you know, cook it so it's nice and soft. But And then you do kind of have to eat it with a knife and fork. You can't really pick it up and eat it with your hands like you could with a regular sandwich. But it's something that I really love. And uh, I like it with like some uh, roasted tomatoes and some goat cheese. And oh, I love eggplant. So. And then for our smart carb options, we have the bulgur and plantains. The plantains may not be something that are super popular around here, but it is something that does have some really good flavor. Um, I typically have had them in the past as fried plantains. So again, not the best choice to have them fried, but they do have some really good flavor as well. And then for our healthy oils, doing a little bit of butter, not a lot, or maybe some avocado. All right, then for our protein here, we have salmon or pork. And then for our veggies, we have the option of Brussels sprouts. Again, one of those vegetables that can kind of get a bad rap, um, but I love Brussels sprouts. Not everyone does. If you have roommates who maybe don't like the smell of Brussels sprouts, maybe warn them ahead of time that you're making it because they do have a little bit of odor when you're cooking them, but they can be done really deliciously. Bell peppers are a great option as well. And then for our smart carb, we have butternut squash or spelt. Again, not being intimidating by the name of something, you know, spelt, what is it? looking and seeing it's a whole grain and it's a great option um, instead of something like rice. 
And then for our healthy fats, maybe some chopped peanuts or chopped almonds, something that you can sprinkle on top of your food, if not using the fat to cook the food directly. All right, so that was a lot of information on mixing and matching. So we're just gonna kind of go back briefly so you can kind of see we really do have a lot of different options here. So we have in, you know, you can kind of pick just straight across doing beans with broccoli, spaghetti squash, and extra virgin olive oil, or you can really mix and match in each different row and column. So there's a lot of different options here that we went over that, you know, are not too crazy. Some of them you may not be as comfortable preparing, but they do have a lot of great options that we can choose from. So being mindful of this, where you can replace this instead with the foods that you like. It doesn't have to be these exact foods, but looking and thinking through what kind of options do you like for your vegetable, for your protein, for your smart carb, and for your healthy fat. All right, so then the second step, so once you have your four options that you wanna do, it's going into portion size. So being mindful of your sizes with that. Now you can actually measure it with different, you know, you can weigh your meat, you can measure everything with a measuring cup. A lot of people don't like to do that necessarily when they're cooking, so being mindful of using your hand. Now, I would say I have slightly larger hands, so I would maybe shrink my <laughs> portions a little bit compared to my palm size, but being mindful um, it's the flat of your palm. Now, it doesn't mean your palm and then, you know, stack this way. It is just that bit of your palm. So being mindful of that uh, versus a fist of veggies is, again, the whole volume of your fist, not just what you can grab in your fist, but the, the physical size of your fist. And then carbs is then what would fit if your hand is cupped into your cupped palm. And then fat would be your thumb. So being mindful of that. And again, going off of just general suggested portion sizes, knowing that you may have different satiety or hunger levels. So this is just a guideline. Again, overall trying to have those, those healthy portions, but there's gonna be days where you eat more, where you eat less, that's okay. It's just, again, aiming for this overall goal. And then adjusting it. You know, are you being more active? Are you training for something? Are you having the results that you want? Are you looking to gain weight or lose weight? Is that actually happening with the portion sizes that you're using? And if not, how can you adjust it? So really being mindful that for every person, this is gonna be different. And you know what works for you is what works for you, and it may not be what works for me. All right, so then step three. So we have our protein, our vegetable, our smart carb, and our healthy fat. We have them in proper proportions. And now we're gonna choose how are we going to garnish it? How are we going to give flavor to this? So again, this is where there's a couple different options, so I'll go through them and then I'll kind of flip back through. Um, but say you're in the mood for Italian, some great spices would be like oregano, basil, or fennel, maybe top something with capers or anchovies or olives or a little bit of orange zest. Um, you know, there's a lot of different options here and I'm not super creative when it comes to cooking. So this is the part that I get excited about because it can tell me, hey, what kind of theme are you looking for with your food and how can you then achieve that theme without having to stress about finding the right recipe? You can literally just grab the ingredients and then flavor it to taste. If you're in the mood for more of a French theme, again, maybe a bay leaf or some black pepper and lemon. There's a lot of different options that you can do there. Maybe you're in the mood for Mexican, so using maybe some cilantro or cumin or cocoa even, or using ancho and chipotle limes or even just lime juice, a really great option there. Uh, more so in the mood for Japanese, miso, which I love some miso soup, yum. Sesame seeds, again, you can do typically plain or toasted if you like that toasted bit or some seaweed. I know that that's not something that oftentimes people think to cook with, but it could be a really great option to flavor some food. Uh, pickled radishes, ginger, yuzu, a lot of great options. Thai food, one of my favorites, uh, using some cilantro or mint or some Thai basil, which is different than the regular basil, or ginger, fresh ginger is gonna have more flavor than the, the canned or the, excuse me, the jarred, but it's still you know using uh, the jarred is fine as well. Or some nice limes or chilies, green onions, some lemongrass, you know, you don't have to use every single option that's listed. You could use one or two. You can jump across, you know, from Mexican to Japanese and really just choose what flavors that you like and what stand out to you. Uh, so with some Moroccan foods, the cardamom, which has a really great flavor to that. I love uh, cardamom ice cream. It actually has a really great flavor to it, and it's something unique because it has a little bit of that savory aspect, even though it's a sweet ice cream. Saffron or cinnamon or anise some cayenne pepper, which is awesome, more cumin, similar to the Mexican food, or maybe some preserved lemon. So a lot of great options here. Indian food, also one of my favorites. I think I just really love food uh, because everything's my favorite, except for onions. Don't give me onions. 
Uh, the Indian food, a lot of great spices here. A lot of great colors in Indian food. If you use a curry powder, you're going to notice that the color of your food is going to be a little bit different, which can help make it more appealing. So be not being too scared of using a curry powder or some fresh curry leaf or some coriander. There's a lot of great uh, variety in Indian food and different spices and flavors you can achieve by pairing different things together. For Caribbean, it's something I'm not as familiar experimenting with, but something like cinnamon, allspice, nutmeg, and cloves. Now, that's something I would put in my pumpkin bread. <laughs> But if you put that on something more savory, you're going to get more of that sweet savory aspect. Um, and, you know, it's a really great um, different thing for me that I would probably want to experiment with on the day where I know I have time to play with my food rather than on a day where I'm rushing and I want my food to be right the first time. Um, but using things like lime or scotch bonnets or pickled mango, um, a lot of great variety there. Or if you're going for more of a Southwest theme, getting back to the cumin, the coriander, cilantro, mint, chilies, pepper, lime. There's some unique things in this list for these different spice flavors that we're going through, but a lot of it I'm sure you're aware of that you've heard of or maybe used in the past. And if not, don't feel like you have to add it in just because it's listed. For more of Spanish flavor, going with some smoked paprika, parsley, bay leaf, or saffron. Gandia peppers, which I've not actually heard of before, olives or orange. Again, you don't have to use an orange slice. It could be something simple like just the zest of an orange. All right, so I'm going to go back through those different options. Then. So did, was there one that stood out to you that you're like, oh, yeah, I love those flavors, or one where you're like, mm, maybe not? So there's a couple different options here that looking through, if you have your protein, your vegetable in mind, what might pair best with your protein and vegetable? Typically, the smart carb and the fat will complement then the uh, protein and vegetable that you've chosen along with the spices. All right, so we have our protein, our vegetable, our smart carb, and our fat. We've chosen our flavor profile. Now we need to cook the food. So again, what I love about this infographic is back in those protein, uh, vegetable, smart carb, and healthy fat slides, they actually show you how to cook the foods that they recommend. So following those steps, Super simple, none of the instructions are very complicated. Thinking about do you want to add any fresh herbs or do you want to garnish with fresh herbs at the end? Are you going to add the dried spices to more to your smart carb, squeezing some fresh lemon juice, and then you know, adding some chopped nuts at the end, things like that. It doesn't all have to be in one dish. You can kind of piece and pair it out so that you get some variety. Additional flavor tips would be doing something like sauteing onions if you like onions. Um, in with your green veggies. So if you choose something like spinach, maybe adding some veggie, some onions in there to saute with it to give the spinach a little bit more flavor. Um, maybe using some pan drippings as a flavorful sauce, trying to be mindful of how much of it is fat and how much of it is flavor drippings. I know when you cook a chicken breast, oftentimes there's those natural juices that come out versus the oil that would come out and maybe float to the top that you might want to avoid. Uh, garlic cloves are a really great addition if you love some garlic, which I know I do or even um, dried chili flakes, grate some fresh horseradish on your protein, um, lots of flavor, minimal effort, and a little bit goes a long, long way <laughs> with something like that. All right, so putting it all on your plate. A lot of times people don't think about what they're eating off of, but eating off of a nice plate, sitting at your table, eating with a knife and fork, versus eating off of a paper plate on your couch with your hands, it's really easy to be less mindful when we're not actually sitting down and focusing on our food or if we have our phone up in front of our faces while we're eating. So being mindful to plate your food, make it look nice. It doesn't have to be gourmet by any means, but really take that time to make it something that you can enjoy when you sit down to eat your food. All right, so here are some sample meals that they provided for us. So if you want Thai food, here's three different ways that you can make Thai food. So picking our Protein would be our steak with some coconut brown rice, so using the coconut oil in the brown rice, and then some bok choy on the side. Perfect little Thai food right there. Or going with chicken with eggplant, spelt, and peanuts. And again, thinking back to those Thai spices, you know, adding some cilantro, some mint, some ginger to give that some nice flavor and add to that flavor profile. Uh, here, um, Indian three ways. Do we want to do maybe some curried chickpeas with eggplant and yogurt? I know that that's a really great flavor profile for me where I love the flavor and the texture of the chickpeas. I love eggplant. The yogurt can kind of help cut some of the, the um, spice if you like to spice it up like I do. 
really great uh, option there for Indian food. We're looking at Mexican food. Um, again, I know that living in Southern California, we have the luxury of having access to some uh, really great Mexican food, but for other people who maybe don't live in an area where there's great Mexican food, um, if it's hard to find something, try making it yourself. Um, it could be something super simple like chicken with spinach and quinoa, but adding those spices to it to help give it that flavor that you're looking for. Um, or I know I love beans, so beans with carrots, brown rice, and some avocado. Not something that you maybe would order directly out of a Mexican restaurant, but something that you can do at home and still give you what you're looking for. All right, so now we're going to build our own sample meal so I can show you how easy this really is. And I know we kind of did this a little bit um, in my last presentation where we picked some different options um, to build a meal. So, all right, so I'm gonna go with salmon. Salmon is something that is really great flavor to it, has those healthy fats in it, and it's a really great protein as well. My personal favorite form of salmon is in salmon sushi. Um, I do prefer the raw salmon, but not everyone likes raw salmon. So we're going to cook our salmon according to the directions listed here. And we're gonna add some bok choy in with it. So again, I said that I was first intimidated by bok choy, but it's something that I actually really love now, and it's got some really great flavor and um, can really pick up the flavor profile of whatever else you're mixing in with it. And I'm gonna choose quinoa as my protein. I feel like quinoa and salmon is just a really great pairing. You get a little bit of the nuttiness from the quinoa, but then with that uh, fish from the salmon, it just makes a really good pairing there. And then I'm gonna use butter. I feel like salmon and butter are a really great pairing. A small amount will be helpful in preparing that. And then I'm gonna go with a French flavor profile with a little bit of black pepper and lemon to do some lemon pepper salmon with bok choy and some quinoa. Now you can see in the picture there's a little bit of things they've added some capers, things like that. So again, you can mix and match across the flavor profiles. You don't have to stick with one thing. Those are just really suggestions for what you might want to mix and match. So how can we make an amazing meal tonight? It's easy to do. Again, uh, I'm going to show the link so you guys can make note of that and uh, go find it and then help yourself to mixing and matching. The template is flexible. Again, you don't have to stick with their recommendations. You can, you know, if you hate bok choy, remove the picture of the bok choy and put a picture of your own favorite food on there instead. Um, it's, it's based off of recommendations, not off of a requirement. Again, remembering that a healthy diet is not a rigid prescription, but it's a framework. Uh, knowing though that these, uh, these recommendations are based on flavor science. So they are some things that have been recommended to pair well together. So thinking about that, if you, know, you go to make a change, being mindful that you may not like that change because the profiles have been recommended because of this flavor science. And the meals will taste great. It's something that, again, is some, it's recommended. It's something that's been tried and true. Again, I'm not the best cook, so some of my meals I end up disappointed in because of me, not because of the meal itself. And they're good for you too. If you follow those portion sizes and the recommendation of the protein, the vegetable, the smart carb, and the healthy fat, it's a really great meal for you. All right, so wrapping up, what can you take away from this? Make those smart choices. It doesn't have to start with completely, you know, doing a 180 on your diet and throwing everything out of your pantry. It could be just starting with simple swaps. And I'm very practical, as Brett mentioned earlier, where if you have something in your house that's a less optimal choice, use it up until it's gone and then don't buy it again. Don't feel like you have to throw it out just because it's less optimal. I know that if I do that where I toss it, I end up craving it and then I'll bring it back into the house anyways versus having a small amount in the house or using it up until it's gone and letting yourself enjoy it. But then looking towards what are those simple swaps that you can make to make a smarter choice. And then start with what you know you like. Again, I'm not gonna rush out and start with cooking some onions. I know I'm not gonna like that. So look at, see what you do like, what you know you'll like, and start there. It doesn't have to be an extremely complex thing. It can be just making those simple swaps, making a choice, picking a food that you know you already like, and then maybe adding a little bit different flavor. And then experiment as you learn. I know that I never would have thought that I would be cooking certain things that I've been cooking lately. And I feel like, there's been some experiments that have gone wrong that have been tossed in the trash. And there's other experiments that I've, you know, kept note and I make a little, um, I track my meals with like little five stars. So I put five stars on a meal that I love and then I 
put one star on the meal that goes in the trash and there's meals in between. Um, and I feel like that's something that's been really helpful for me to know what ingredients do I want to buy again? What foods do I want to buy again? Um, you know, the, the actual core part of the meal. And it's been helpful in making me more successful with those healthy meals. And again, once you have a good foundation of what you know you like, it allows you to experiment to learn new flavors that you might like and new flavors that you don't like. So I guess in that way, there's no failed experiment if you learn something you don't like as much as what you do like. So. All right, so this is the Precision Nutrition Infographics. I'm going to leave this up for a little bit because um, the next slide is just going into questions. So if you want to make note of this slide or you can even just Google Precision Nutrition Perfect Meal Infographic. Um, but it's a really, really, really great tool. And one of the first tools that I feel is truly visual where I could print it out. They do actually have um, a link where you can click on it and it has it split up into pages so you can print it out. And I have this on the side of my fridge. It's something super simple that I can just quickly glance at, reference, and know that I'm going to make a healthy meal by choosing the options here. Uh, again, like I said, I'm not going to be one to toss certain things in that I know I don't like. But I know that I love eggplant. I know I love the bok choy, the spinach. The kale I've just left out, but I could probably replace that with some other vegetable that I like. And it really gives me a great option without forcing me to panic about what I'm going to eat or what I need to buy at the grocery store or anything like that. So I really do enjoy this tool. And hopefully you all are all able to get some enjoyment out of it as well and use it to help make some healthy meals. And with that, Brett, I would like to open it up for questions. Great. Who do we have? Um, anyone have any questions? You just you can also unmute yourself if you have questions, or you can raise your hand in some capacity and we'll unmute you. Anyone for questions? Katie? Well, I don't have a question per se, oh, yeah. but um, I think this is uh, an amazing tool, and I really appreciate this tool. Um, I have to have a heart healthy diet. Um, going mm -hmm. forward, I always should have, but going forward, I'm really working on it. And I think being able to print this out and have it readily available, just as a reference, you know, that maybe not as a recipe, but as a reference when I'm looking at recipes and I'm looking at stuff that I can um, utilize it. So I think it's a great tool. So thanks, Beck. I really appreciate the, the tool. Um, I'm looking at, you know, do I go to Sunbasket and do these other things or do I do stuff myself. So I think this helps me feel more confident in, in picking out stuff myself. Yeah. Well, and, and notice how salt was not in any of the flavor profiles. So that's something that you can definitely add to taste, but a lot of those flavors make it so that you don't really need to add salt to your meals. Yes. And toasted sesame oil is my new found favorite. I did a flank steak because mm -hmm. that, that's not a very fat. Uh, protein also, and oh, it smelled so good. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I had a question. Well, and you, you, yes, go ahead. Um, I have to uh, really uh, reduce my salt intake, and I can look at the uh, nutrition labels on boxes and stuff like that. And I really don't know how to judge how much salt I'm getting from. Uh, meats and fish and, and fresh produce and things like that. So that the content of, of sodium or of salt in like, if you just have a piece of steak that's a raw piece of meat, that's not going to have any sodium levels to it. Um, again, trace, trace, trace amounts in fruits and vegetables, but not necessarily anything to worry about. It's more so how you're cooking the vegetable when you're adding salt that way being mindful of how much you add because one teaspoon of salt already puts you over your daily recommendation. So um, I wouldn't worry about the content of fresh fruits and vegetables, fresh protein, things like that. If it's something like that's preserved um, or canned, being mindful to go for, if you're going for beans, look for the ones that are, are low sodium beans rather than the just regular canned beans. Uh, for proteins, being mindful of any type of dried meats or jerkies, things like that, that can have um, some preservatives that are sodium-based that will help increase the sodium content. So I don't think you have to worry about the, the fresh foods, the whole foods. It's just being mindful of how you cook it or how they're prepared if they're not fresh. Thank you. 
-hmm. Questions from anyone else? I know, Beck, can you answer? So I know, I, um, oh, go ahead. Who was, there was someone? Yeah, I, yeah, uh, yeah, this is Scott. I have a hey, question Scott. about uh, nutritional labels. I, I try and follow those and make smart choices and I understand there's there's some new or updated information that's supposed mm -hmm. to come out on the labels. Is there a good resource to, to find out how to interpret some of that stuff? Sometimes it gets a little confusing. Yes, so if you actually, if you're able to hop on in two weeks, one of my dietitians, Rachel, will actually be going over the label and how to really read that and be understanding what it means rather than just looking at it and saying, okay, there's, you know, 150 calories in this, what does that mean? So if you're able to tune back in in, in two weeks, Rachel will be going over that. Okay. Uh, Beck, I have a question. <clears throat> um, some of the foods that were suggested produce a lot of sugar um, when they're cooked or even prior to being cooked like beets. And none of that was really addressed other than refined sugar. Um, how does that affect diet? So again, I'm very practical with that and I believe in eating whole foods. I know that, you know, there's something, things like carrots can, you know, when you cook them, it does break down some of the complex carbohydrates into more simple carbs. Um, I don't think that having a handful of cooked carrots is going to be an issue if it's for general health, if it's something where you have type 2 diabetes and you're extremely sensitive to any type of carbohydrate, being mindful to have consistent, consistent amounts at your meals. Um, I am not a huge proponent of a very low carb diet. I do believe in having a consistent amount of carbs because your brain does function on carbs and it only functions on ketones when in ketosis, which is not a natural state. So um, for that, I'm not worried about the natural sugars that come from carrots. I'm worried about the chocolate cake with frosting and, you know, cherry drizzle in the middle and the maraschino cherry on top. That's the kind of thing that I'd be more worried about. Um, I'm, you know, if you're choosing a, a protein, a, a vegetable that maybe has some natural carbs in it, but then also choosing a smart carb. So for example, one of the smart carbs was a uh, squash, which is a vegetable, but it also is in there as a smart carb choice. Um, potatoes are another option where a lot of people fear potatoes because they are high in carbohydrates, but if you use that as the carbohydrate for your meal, not the vegetable, it's a great way to incorporate the potato into your diet and much better than the potato chip. You know, having a baked potato with maybe a little bit of butter and then a side of some wilted spinach with a lean piece of steak, that's a healthy meal to me. And I'm not too worried that the potato has natural sugars in it. It's more so, again, if you have that, that cookie afterwards on a regular basis, again, every so often it's fine, but looking and seeing what your overall diet pattern is and making swaps based off of that versus having to force yourself to make every single meal perfectly healthy. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So Beck, uh, when using a, I use like my fitness pal to track food because I bike a lot and I try to, you know, watch my diet and do all those kind of things. And so, you know, you, you finish your workout, regardless of it is whatever you're tracking or you're doing steps at work right now and doing all these things. And then it says you've burned X amount of, <laughs> you know, I, I, there's just no way that no matter what I'm doing, I, I could not have burned three. I mean, possibly, but I could not have burned 3000 calories. And then it adds it to it and says, you need 3000 more in your diet today. And I'm like, there's just no physical way to do that. And so I don't know, how do you read, how do you decipher those things or read them where you can actually get enough nutrients so I don't under eat in some ways or I right. eat the right components? I mean, how do you, do you have any guidelines yeah. on how to use that kind of applications? Yeah, so that's always just an estimate. The only true way to know how many calories being burned is through what's called indirect calorimetry. Um, excuse me, I have a cat hair. Um, so through indirect calorimetry, which we can do on patients who are hospitalized when they're intubated, because you were, you were able to measure exactly what they're breathing in and breathing out and measure that. Um, other research studies have done it where they literally lock someone in a controlled room where they are able to measure exactly how much that person is breathing in and out for a period of time. And they control exactly what food goes in, and then they measure how that affects the person. They control 
how much exercise the person does in the room and measure that. So the app, any kind of app is always just an estimate. And I think the true results are shown on the scale. If that's your goal is to maintain weight or lose weight or gain weight, if it's working, the scale will reflect that. If it's not working, then the scale will reflect that. And being mindful of that. And then again, just as far as other nutrients beyond just overall calories, looking at your satiety levels. Are you hungry immediately after eating? Well, did you get enough protein? Did you get enough fiber? Uh, are you eating often enough? Are you, you know, depriving yourself of a snack because you, ha you think you have to hold out until dinner, where I typically am fine skipping breakfast. I'll maybe have my coffee in the morning, eat nothing, and then I'll have lunch, but then I'll have a snack between lunch and dinner. And that's almost become like my third meal because that's what works for me. And I know that I'm going to have that mid-afternoon slump where I need to have a snack. And being mindful of that, of what you grab for your snack, what you're having at your meals, and how that affects your energy. I know that if I have something like a cookie, that afternoon slump is going to get worse because I'm going to have that sugar crash. Versus if I do have, you know, a little bit of Greek yogurt that maybe has some fruit in it, there's got some good protein, some fat, some sugar in there, and that's almost a perfect quote unquote meal in a snack. So really being mindful of what are your personal goals and how you know are you reaching them or are you falling short in some areas? And then looking to see how your diet can help you adapt in those areas. Now in the US we really don't often struggle with overall nutrient deficiencies unless you have a pre existing condition or an unknown condition. Um, it typically does not hurt to take a general multivitamin, especially as we get older and our stomach acid, um, the ability to digest reduces. So it wouldn't be the worst idea to take a general multivitamin as we get older. Typically, and I know there, it's been in the news a lot lately, in the US we are short on vitamin D. And it's been in the news a lot as far as you know being linked to COVID and that's not why I think it's just a general good recommendation. It's in general more so that the U.S. is known to be more deficient in it. Even in Southern California where we do get more sunlight and we have the ability to produce more vitamin D, we're often still deficient in it. And that's one that can really affect your energy, your overall health, and how you feel. So if you are low in vitamin D, supplementing that to get it back to a solid level and then maintaining that solid level will really help you with your energy levels. So really thinking through what are your goals, how do you feel, and if it's something where you're struggling to, you know, ongoing have energy, you know, thinking, okay, is it vitamin D, is it iron, is it B12? And talking to your doctor or your registered dietitian and saying, hey, what might be some, some ways I can change my diet to boost these items in my, in my diet? Or is it time that I take a supplement to bring those levels back to normal? Thank you. Additional questions from people. Okay. Maybe someone's trying to unmute. I don't know, but all right. I don't see any additional questions, Beck. But um, and as Beck said, in two weeks we'll have um, Rachel from her department will be um, talking about you know label efficacy and that kind of stuff and how to read them and really understand what you're putting in and what you're looking at. And then next week will be physical therapy and you know, mobility and stretching. And so um, it'll be good. Well, Beck, I uh, thank you again. I'm always learn so much every time we have a chance to talk and I'm always like thinking that now I need a snack or now I need food. <laughs> <laughs> so I appreciate that. All right, everybody. Absolutely. Well, well thank, thank you for having me. Good. Thank you so much. Candace, anything else from you? No, I don't think so. I think I'm getting, I'm getting very excited about the one where we're reading the labels because the sodium content in stuff and how much we're supposed to have daily always confuses me. So I'm yeah. kind of excited to have that since, since the sodium content is so um, important to a heart-healthy diet. Um, and I'm very confused and I'm just kind of flying by the seat of my pants. So I'm really excited to be able to, to finally gain that, gain that knowledge. So um, I'll be looking forward to that one for sure. And thank you, everyone. Um, I, you know, I kind of forgot in the beginning in the last couple of weeks to actually introduce myself. I'm Candace Nichols, and I am the program director at the center. Um, I got to remember to do that at the beginning from now on. 
Um, but um, I just want to thank you all for joining in. And I hope you have a good evening. And as always, stay safe. All right, she just froze. Yeah. I think her audio cut off. All right, thank you, everybody.